Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Atomy Brainwaves, our podcast on education for educators. Brainwaves is produced by our wonderful team here at Atomy. What is Atomy? It's an online teaching and learning platform for secondary education. We provide engaging, curriculum-specific video and text lessons for over 190 subjects, as well as matching quizzes and exam practice that can be used for both learning and formative assessment. We also provide powerful analytics that can help teachers diagnose how their students are progressing and zero in on who might need a little bit of extra help. Our goal is to help make life easier for our teachers, give them more time to work on the most important things, and ultimately help to generate better outcomes. If you want to find out more about Atomy, head over to our main site at getatomy.com and feel free to try it out for free. Today, I got to speak to Guy Claxton, professor author, and creator of the Learning Power Approach. He unpacked for us in detail the Learning Power Approach, the research behind it, and its practical applications in the classroom. If that sounds like your kind of thing, feel free to subscribe to us on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you like to do your listening. And we'll never say no to a quick five-star review while you're at it. In the meantime, give this episode a listen, and I hope you enjoy it. Can it teach us anything? What, you want me to teach you something? You want to learn something? All right. You got it! Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Atomy Brainwaves. I'm your host Simon and today I'm joined by a very special guest, Guy Claxton, Emeritus Professor of the Learning Sciences at the University of Winchester, author of more than 20 books on education, educational consultant and the originator of the Learning Power Approach. Welcome, Guy. Ah, oh, very nice to be with you, Simon. Thank you. Very nice to have you. And this, I, I can see here on our on our um, Zoom call screen that you are you seem to be in some sort of library in some sort of wonderfully <laughs> learned uh, learned setting full of books full of I'm knowledge in, right I'm you. in what I call my garden shed if you could if I was going to swing my camera around uh, I could show you the fields and the cows and the stream and the pond because uh, I'm in a I'm in a rather posh office shed at the bottom of my garden which is where so, where, where I spend a lot of my time so idyllic, where where knowledge meets nature yeah. sounds like the the perfect setting for a exactly for a chat on all things. Knowledge meets things nature, and, and occasionally it meets video games and all kinds of other things <laughs> that I shouldn't be spending my time doing. Well, you, you know, you don't need to reveal that. As far as we're <laughs> concerned, it's all academic research oh. and study and, and okay. all the rest. Okay. But um, sure. what we'll what we'll start off with, yeah, is. A run through of your journey in education. Now, what we're going to get around to is kind of uh, sort of your area of expertise, something you've, as I said in the intro there, you originated the learning power approach yep. and something you have taught extensively and written extensively about. But before we get to there, yep. we just like to, as, as regular listeners will know, start off with a run through of your journey in education, where you began, the various turns along the road that led you to where you are now. Uh, well, that could be an hour's worth, but let let me let me try and give you the uh, a brief give you the short brief, version. Uh, uh, my secondary school was a boarding school in an English town called Worcester, uh, where I was a pretty average student. I think I was a- average, poor to average at almost everything. My re- my academic reports were were okay, but they're great. I never stood out as being sort of leadership or prefect material. I wasn't very good at games, and I certainly wasn't very good at girls. So I was just sort of coasting along. Um, and then I encountered a rather maverick, bohemian would have been the term at the time, chemistry teacher, a man called Michael Scheer. And I was he really turned me on to chemistry. Uh, and taught me what what we called A level chemistry, which is all through discovery and discussion and exploration, and I just loved it. And I I was got all set to be a chemistry teacher, and I went. I was lucky enough to get a place at Cambridge where I was going to uh, study chemistry, uh, which I did for two years. 
But at Cambridge, God bless it, you had to study other subjects. You couldn't just do your main subject. So I studied a bit of physiology and a bit of cell biology and a bit of mathematics. And in my second year, I studied a bit of psychology. And uh, the end of the second year exams revealed to me what I feared was going to be the case, which was that chemistry had completely got away from me. It was just boring, hard. I couldn't engage with it at all, and I was floundering, and I got a really poor mark. And psychology was just like a duck to water psychology for me. So I, at the end of, the end of that year, you got a kind of, you know, I was doing two, two double chemistry and one psychology. And I got a lower second in the chemistry, the two lots of chemistry, and I got a first in the psychology, and I got a first overall. So if you average all that out, it must have been what we used to call in those days shit hot first. In order it must have been. In it order to been. in order to get that average. So that then steered me on to I, I much to my mother's disappointment, I gave up the ambition of being a chemistry teacher and then moved to Oxford to do a PhD in psychology and while I was there and I really don't know why I think it must have been the lingering uh, memory of this wonderful chemistry teacher Michael Shea that got me interested as a sort of sideline in education I started going to education seminars and uh, when I finished my doctorate which is very kind of academic psychology on psycholinguistics and the organization of the mental dictionary uh, I was looking around for jobs and I got a part-time job at the Institute of Education in London teaching psychology of education and I just got more and more interested in education at the same time I was also broadening out my psychological interests and I was getting involved in a whole variety of weird and wonderful sort of personal development sort of you know psychotherapy for the worried well you might call it now uh, personal exploration stuff. Uh, having been a, a straight down the line experimental cognitive psychologist, I was now getting involved in all kinds of more holistic uh, kinds of things. And that was really coming to life in education, the work that I was doing in education. Um, so that was what got me on the track. And then the cognitive bit of me was had always been very interested in learning, the processes of learning. And then, the, and so those two sides, the more holistic side, was interested in particularly the kind of experiential or emotional learning that I was doing through these groups, individual therapy and group meetings and so on, was marrying with the side of me that was intellectually interested in what was going on when I was learning. And that led fairly quickly to a sort of abiding interest, really, in what the fundamental purpose of education was in terms of learning and how we could help young people uh, basically what the rest of my academic life has been about was how we could help young people get better at learning yeah wow amazing a, a, a really interesting journey um i i feel perhaps the world has been denied a wonderful chemistry teacher in there <laughs> but uh maybe who knows? he's he's, he's well, still in there somewhere <laughs> he's still in there somewhere it's never too late you never know late yeah. career change but um, what, what, what's kind of interesting for me there is that, you know, a lot of the guests that we have on there, wherever they've ended up in, in terms of in the education world, it, it, it oftentimes starts from a place of school teaching, that traditional school teaching role and kind of building on from that position and what they observe there within the classroom. But it sounds to me a little bit like your journey is, is, is almost more sort of an outside in perspective. Would that be fair to say? in terms of with psychology yeah. and coming at it from that approach, which I guess what it sounds to me a little bit like is that it, that maybe has afforded you almost maybe a bigger picture perspective where it's more about the, yeah. the broader landscape that, versus I, just I think that's right. Specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like, I think you know, there's, there are three things coming together if I think back about it. There was my own varied experience at school and particularly being gripped by the, the teachers at school who were more maverick, who had a more emotional or experiential attitude. I remember being taught, you know, getting very excited by the teacher who taught us drama in the sixth form. And we were studying kinds of modern plays, which was a revelation to me. 
But it was uh, above all this guy called Michael Shea, who intrigued me because he was a very engaging chemistry teacher during the day, and in the evening he taught Zen meditation, and right. and used to run. He used to write poetry, and write, and probably still does, and run poetry and jazz evenings with with a friend of his. So he was a kind of role model for me of someone who could be deeply interested, intellectually interested in molecules and reaction pro processes and titration and all that technical stuff. And at the same time, somehow or other, that's all be wrapped in a much sort of deeper and wider, richer, I would say, sense of what being a human being is all about. So, I, and I think Michael Sher, it, interestingly, I uh, later on in my career, when I was working uh, at um, King's College in London, I rediscovered Michael Sher, who had become a professor of science education, and wow. we reignited our friendship. He's w well retired now, but I think I, just, I looked him up the other day. He must be getting on for 90, but I, he's still alive, which made me very happy. Amazing. God, we, we must try and get him on, uh, on the podcast <laughs> at some stage. He sounds like quite the, quite the character. Who really interesting, have. man. Really interesting. Yeah, a lot to say. Right. But it's, it's, you know, it's also, it, 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 it sounds as well that he's doing very much great work in sort of, I guess, working past what maybe would be that stereotypical view, yeah. possibly unfairly, that one would have of a science teacher or even a scientist, someone who is very much completely... I don't know, maybe very, very uh, left brain oriented. Yeah, shall sure. We say sure. who's totally focused on the kind of analytical yeah. side of things. Yeah. But interesting to hear about about someone who obviously has that in abundance, but also has this real artistic, creative side. To, sure, and there, to there, there may be another streak here, which is, I've come across, I've come across in my career working in education, a series. I couldn't tell you how many of people, very interesting people working in education as academics, sociologists or history, historians of education or psychologists, who are refugees from chemistry. Wow. Uh, so there may be, I haven't really thought my way into this, but there may be some other deeper link between that the, the causes some people to make that bridge or, or to make that jump from, from the... I don't know quite how to describe it, the very controlled and formal world of the periodic table and molecules and reactions and all of that good stuff into something. And, and it's not a rejection. It was just another, it was another side. I still, in, I don't read much chemistry these days, but um, I still have a respect, respect for that side of things. So I think it gave me a bit of, a bit of left brain and right brain together. Yeah, absolutely, which I'm sure was definitely beneficial in, in terms of the the research and the theory building that that you you experienced and undertook throughout your career, which is sort of where we're going to lead on to now. Because mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to we're we're, we're going to try and cover as much of the the learning power approach, all of its very various elements and facets as we go. I'm sure we will only manage to scratch the surface sure. uh, during our chat, but we'll see what we can do. But I guess. Sure. Let's start at the very beginning and, you know, begin by getting, if we can, from yourself an outline of, you know, just first of all, what learning power is, how you would define learning power as the starting block of, of, this, uh, of this theory. Sure. Uh, so I was towards the end of my time do, as I, doing my doctorate, I began to start reading around a sort of general broad field that's become become known as learning to learn. And through my reading and my work in uh, psychology, in experimental psychology, I became very interested in an emerging field of study, which was about what you might call the learnability of learning itself that we saw you know the old-fashioned way of thinking about learning is what determines your learning is how bright you are how and how what and how much effort you put in that's the kind of lay theory you know the old-fashioned mm. school report you know guy struggles at physics 
and messes about in geography, right? It's like those, those, those kinds of attributions. But what was emerging from the technical literature of what came to be called cognitive science, I call myself a cognitive scientist these days, was what, what we would call more technically the malleability of mind. That is to say, what we thought of as being things that were determined, for example, by something that you couldn't change, like IQ or intelligence, is actually a composite of a whole lot of learnt habits and attitudes and skills. So what makes you good at learning? There may be an element of IQ. I don't particularly want to get into that argument. But there is, un incontrovertibly, a much bigger or a, certainly a very large element of things that you've picked up, of experiences that you've had that have shaped the way you engage, the confidence and the skill with which you engage with things that are difficult, challenging, uncertain, ambiguous, strange, disconcerting, surprising, disappointing. That's what learning is. Learning is engaging with those things, things that you don't understand, things that you can't do yet. That's my definition. So learning power is a sort of, it's an informal notion which, which points at all those different ingredients and elements that make you good at engaging with uncertainty and difficulty. And that's, and I became more and more interested about what those elements and what those ingredients are. Obviously, things like, I mean, we've developed a great long sort of anatomy of what those habits of mind are, and other people have as well. There are other people who have been working along this similar similar lines, mostly people who are friends of mine, um, who have become friends of mine now. But things like the ability to concentrate, how good you are at tapping into your imaginative side, uh, how good you are at collaborating with other people how good you are at sticking with things when they're difficult and not saying, oh, this is stupid or I feel stupid and giving up prematurely. How good you are at ha ta taking a sceptical attitude towards things that people tell you. Often learning starts from somebody going, hey, hold on a minute, is that really true? Is that fake news? Is that just a bit of folk wisdom that people have always assumed? It, start, it starts with being good at research, with being good at curiosity. So I'm just beginning to kind of illustrate for you what some of those ingredients are. And what's exciting is the discovery that all of these faculties can be either blunted or sharpened by experience. People vary enormously in their tolerance for uncertainty or their willingness to accept a new challenge of something that they don't know that they can look good at already. And that is mm. born of experience. And the exciting thing for educators is, you know, kids spend about somewhere between, I don't know, 15 and 18,000 hours of their young lives in school. So school is a place where we have the opportunity to influence that trajectory not just to influence people's knowledge, but to influence at a deeper level the way people go about engaging with, you know, claims of knowledge in history, or how to correct your golf swing, or mm. coping with your first baby, or with an elderly parent, or being made redundant, or setting up your own small company. All of these I would include within the learning challenges that life is going to throw at you one way or another and you'll probably prosper better in life if you aren't bigoted, timid, anxious, dependent, defensive in the face of those challenges. But if all other things being equal, you say, that's interesting, I don't know about that. Let me go and have a look at it. Let me go and find out. So I, have, I see a possibility and for, since the first book I wrote about this was called Live and Learn back in 1984. So I don't know how many years ago that is, but quite a long time ago. Um, getting on for 35 years, something like that. 
Something like uh, that. So it's, an, it's been an abiding interest and gradually evolving and shaping the concept of learning power and refining it and clarifying it and assembling the scientific evidence behind it. And, and yeah. then saying, and how do we translate that into practical things that teachers can do in busy classrooms, which steer youngsters in the direction of wanting to dig deeper, to take more responsibility, to exercise their curiosity, to take more charge of their own learning, rather than, and I didn't realize this until later on in my career, the sort of undertow in many classrooms is the opposite of that. It steers young people in the direction of becoming more passive, more compliant, more docile, more only interested in the right answer, more frightened of new things because you, you're ashamed of not being able to look good at them quickly. And for lots of uh, young people, so I'm interested in that undertow and what hmm. thing what the things that little practical things that teachers can do to create that rip to use an australian word create the mm -hmm. rip that just pulls you it's not cause and effect because we're dealing with complex human beings but just creates that kind of unspoken invitation towards becoming more interested in engaging with difficult things digging deeper saying to the I often say to teachers when I'm working with them you know you're you know you've got that undertow working right you know you're well on the way when you throw a complicated problem at your class you give them 10 minutes in small groups to to have a grapple with it and then you say okay do you want me to tell you the answer and they all say no sir no leave us to it we think we're nearly there we're making progress mm. that's a that's a mindset change from yeah. the stereotypical traditional classroom where the kids are just sitting there waiting, gasping for someone to tell them the right answer so that they can remember it and move and well enough to do on the test and move on. So that in a yeah. nutshell is what my whole my work has been about for the last thirty five years or so. Yeah. And it's a really it's a really powerful concept in a number of ways and it's really fascinating to hear you explain, you know, that link the, the, the importance of attitude within all of this mm -hmm. and the link between experience and and learning and it, it's kind of funny because it, it may, it's perhaps something that maybe we can in day-to-day -day life accept a little more easily in other facets you know for instance when in terms of someone's social skills or how they carry themselves it, it, maybe it's almost more natural or easy to say like oh yeah I can see how they're they're funny because their their parents are funny or they're loud because his brother is loud or whatever but it, it only follows that that is also going it, to it, it's going to be very similar in terms of approach to learning right and yeah and, sure and an and attitude that all of your environmental factors are going to yeah play a play a big role yeah absolutely um, and it gets you know the older we get i mean it is true that you know it's not that you can't teach an old dog new tricks but uh, you know, we we get more set in our ways. We we are creatures of habit, and necessarily so, and beneficially so. You know, I couldn't have got here this morning without habits of dressing, habits of making my breakfast, habits of you know cleaning my teeth, habits of you know doing my exercises with my wife in the living room before the day gets going. Without having to think about them and challenge them, of course, we need those grooves that for things that we do economically so we get grooved yeah. by experience but at the same time you know we also want to retain the ability to be malleable and we all know i guess you know and i know old people who've gone both ways you know there are some old people you know who are amazingly fresh and lively and inquisitive and open and interested in things and there are other people who've just sunk into their ruts and their grooves so mm. if it if it's not just a biological thing or a genetic thing, which it which I don't think it can be, what is it that makes that difference? What is it that you know it enables you to stay fresh? You know, and I'm going to be my birthday is the day after tomorrow. I'm going to be 73, and it's you know, and it's this is a matter of some interest to me at the moment. It's like <laughs> keeping my antennae alive and mm. staying engaged and there's lots of research that people age much better if they have learning power 
if they remain inquisitive and curious and doing the crossword puzzle and watching interesting informative in programs on television and etc 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 so i think this really contributes this is a deep p function of education in mm. fact you could well, you could say I've, ne I've never thought of this before but you could say that the, the purpose of education is to prepare people to retain their inquisitiveness when they get elderly well let me just say you know you I, I think that all of the things you're doing are definitely working because in terms of setting up recording equipment uh at the start of this at this call despite you telling me that you had no experience with it it was a seamless process <laughs> so i let, let me just say from my uh from from what i've seen you're doing a, a, a fantastic job of taking to it yeah. perhaps even quicker than i would let me say if it was my first well time that's it, but... that's very kind of you if you knew me better you wouldn't say that all of the time <laughs> I'm always, well, well, when I'm talking to you, I'm, I'm reminded of one of my favorite. Do you know Larson, the cartoonist, the Larson cartoons? Gary Larson. Oh, I love you Gary know Larson. You know Larson. Yeah. So one of my favorites is there's a circus tent and, there, and there's a packed audience and there's a, there's a tightrope up, the, up across. And in the middle of this tightrope, there's a dog and he's rotating a hula hoop and he's balancing on this tightrope and he's juggling balls in his hands and he's also mm -hmm. balancing a cat on a long pole that's that he's that is balancing on his nose and the caption says high above the hushed crowd rex tried to stay focused but still he couldn't rid himself of one nagging thought he was an old dog and this was a new trick. <laughs> so that's like how your mind Fantastic. plays tricks, you know. So that's like the mindset, you know. He couldn't quite get rid of the mindset yeah. that this that it might all fall apart because he was an old dog. So that's yeah, a, a cautionary a, tale for us old dogs. A cautionary tale put in a hilarious way and only the way Gary Larson can. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, as, as much as I would love to continue swapping our favorite Gary Larson cartoons, I feel like unfortunately we've got to get back onto. Well, not unfortunately, sure. we've got to get back onto the sure, sure. onto the education kick. Yep. But um, before you know, you talked there about the the practical element in bringing the learning approach into the classroom, which we're we're going to get to shortly. But before we get there, one thing I just wanted to ask you about is, you know, just in in kind of researching in advance. Uh, how your writing has developed it's sort of in terms of the the, the way it, I guess the practical branding mm -hmm. you know I, we saw initially that idea of building learning power and how that has transitioned in more recent years into the learning power approach and I just wanted to ask you quickly you know what what was the significance of that 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 transition and that kind of that change in how in how that was sure. not just named but how yeah. you know the the approach the approach changed with regards to the that sort of change thank you um yeah it's it's an interesting part of my my journey simon back in 19 i mean i wrote my first book about learning to learn as i said in 1984 i wrote a more academic book in 1999 which was called wise up the challenge of lifelong learning um in which i assembled all the research around the idea of learning power and around the learnability of learning, the idea that learning itself was a craft that people could develop. And a friend of mine called Graham Powell, who was uh, an education advisor and who I'd done a bit of work with, had some friends who ran a little education co company, consultancy and publishing company. Uh, and Graham said to me, this, this book, Wise Up, was really informative, groundbreaking. He was very nice about it. But he said it's 300 pages long. and It's got lots of references in it. Teachers aren't going to read it. Would you like to come and work with us, with this little company? It's called TLO Limited. And see if you could create a more practical, teacher-friendly book. And I said, yeah, that's a great idea. I'd love to do that. Um, and that book was called Building Learning Power. So that became our version if you like our brand name as we were very much sort of on our own really particularly in england developing these ideas and turning them into practical things that worked with teachers that that worked for for teachers 
But as the years went on, so I became aware, we became aware of many other research groups around the world in America, in uh, Canada, in Australia. There was a group out of Monash in uh, Monash University in mm -hmm. Melbourne uh, operating, has been going for about 30 years or so, uh, around what's called the Peel Project, the Project for the Enhancement of Effective Learning. Still going and very, very formal, very formative uh, in terms of shaping the field back in those days. And I just became more and more aware that there were lots of little brands in the marketplace. My friend Art Costa had developed something called Habits of Mind. Various people who'd been associated with Project Zero at Harvard University were developing their own versions of this. Ron Berger was getting involved with something called Expeditionary Learning. Ron Richart was developing something that he called Intellectual Character or Visible Thinking and so on and so on. And about five or six years ago, I began to feel that it was a pity that there were so many of us who were thinking, developing in very similar ways, who were nevertheless sort of positioned into as competing brands, so to speak, in a sort of global marketplace. Uh, and I became, became, became more uncomfortable with that. So now I would like to feel that I've I am positioned myself more as a spokesman on behalf of a developing school of thought, a philosophy and a pedagogy and an approach to assessment and an approach to school leadership, a sort of package, a way of thinking about what school is for and how to do it, which should be something that it should be in the public domain, not something that is just, this is my theory. No, 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 this is my theory. Of course, there are differences between the different versions. So I started writing. We've now produced a series of four books, myself and my colleagues, around this idea of the learning power approach, which is drawing on, synthesizing, communicating work from all of these different research groups and trying to trying to sniff out the essence of what's going on here rather than compartmentalizing these different contributions. So hence the slight change in nomenclature. Hey folks, hope you're enjoying the episode so far and we've got plenty more to come after this quick break. Here at Atomy Brainwaves, we're all about education and not just for students, for ourselves too. We would love to hear from you whether that's feedback on one of our episodes or a question you'd like to see answered by one of our guests or by Sue. So, if you've got a comment or a question, don't hesitate to email us at brainwaves at getatomy.com. Looking forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, let's get back to it. Mm. Yeah, well, it sounds like definitely the, the kind of right way to come at it, the right approach, you know, rather than putting up these barriers between different different schools of thought, opening it up to to let all everything come together and uh, and create the fullest picture that you can, and and that kind of ties a little bit into what I wanted to ask you next, which is a little bit about the kind of the research and the science underpinning and behind the learning power approach. Now we won't spend too long on this because obviously we want to get around to the the nitty gritty of the practicalities, but. I just think it might be interesting for our listeners to hear a little bit. You know, you, you talked about how just there, a, a good portion of it is synthesizing the best mm. from the research and the and the learnings done in, in, in other parts of the world and other institutions which are doing their own or their own research. But I just wanted to see if you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, the I guess the, yeah, the research, the evaluations, that, that underpin uh, the learning power approach and, uh, and the findings gleaned from those and I guess how those findings have helped mold uh, the learning power approach into what it is Sure, today. sure. Um, I think, I mean, what we haven't done, and I'm ambivalent about this, is sort of large-scale, randomised control trials of the conventional, what, what's often thought of as the gold standard. And I'm ambivalent about that. On the one hand, you know, that, that is 
the most reliable of a particular kind of research and a kind of research that I'm extremely comfortable with and used to doing, the kind of research that I was doing for my DPhil in Oxford all those years ago. But when it comes to something like changing the culture of the classroom or our most recent book is around changing the culture of a whole school so that you change what I earlier called the undertow or the mood music of what's going on in the classrooms and the schools. This becomes necessarily becomes what my, some people call a complex intervention, which means that you lose the heart of it if you try and pull it apart and do a kind of does this little bit cause this little change. The actual, the whole thing, the essence of a culture is, a, is an interwoven set of influences that create a mood or a, a way of being or a way of thinking and talking or doing things. So I style a lot of the kind of intellectual background that I've been doing to the learning power approach more as what I call pre-search rather than research. There's an awful lot of research which is wasted because it spends time and money researching things that are way too simplistic or even out of date. Like there's a lot of, there's a complete dead end of research around at the moment, which is some kind of research-based battle between which is better, discovery learning or direct instruction. I'm writing about this at the moment. And it's just like a sort of, you know, two old punch-drunk heavyweight fighters slugging each other out in the 17th mm -hmm. round of a 20-round match. You know, it's like the same old punches being thrown back and forward. And it's not getting you anywhere because the conceptualization is too simple, too rigid, too, and indeed often too wrapped up in out-of-date science, out-of-date cognitive science. So I, a lot, my work has been more about how to create the conceptualization which is worth researching. The research that we've done, we, we, we have done a fair bit of research, but it's been much more along the lines of detailed case study researches of the work of individual teachers or the work particularly of schools or chains of schools. And that work, okay. that, that kind of research, that kind of validation research is building, in, although it's individual schools or individual teachers, and therefore it, that research, sort of research has limitations, the weight of it that is building now uh, is very convincing. Um, yeah. bit, a recent paper by a friend of mine, or a couple of friends of mine, Neil Mercer and James Mannion at the University of Cambridge, have they've just published a very detailed comparative study of two groups within a school. Uh, in England, showing very convincingly ha the, the positive effect on students' achievement and attitudes of this shift of tone in the classroom. And most interestingly, all students benefit from this in their study, but the students who benefit most are the students from disadvantage or low, low, low achieving backgrounds. In their study, wow. By, by initiating this complex intervention, this culture change process, over a period of three, four or five years, they've almost eliminated the gap between the lower, the lower achieving and the higher achieving students. And that's for many jurisdictions, for many countries, for Australia and certainly for the UK, that's a, that's a sort of, you know, the holy grail of education is, you know, how do we close that gap so that education becomes a more fulfilling and empowering experience for everybody. So that's a, a longer answer perhaps than you wanted, but that's to sort of justify the kind of research and the attitude to research that we've taken in, in my group. No, it sounds, you know, I guess the really relevant thing there, which you, which you touched on is that, you know, what's, what's your goal, what's your outcome, and, and then tailoring the search to, research to suit that. And it, it, it almost sounds a little bit like a, a, if we're comparing what you talked about at the top, which is this kind of 
large randomized group uh, controlled experiments versus when you're talking about more case studies it's almost sounds if i could be sort of simplified a, a sort of a breadth versus depth kind of approach where yeah you know that, that that more traditional perhaps approach would would certainly cover a larger surface area but doesn't lend itself to particularly deep types of uh, types of study there's only so much yeah. you can find out through through that whereas okay maybe you're not touching across quite as big as a sample size but case studies yes you can go into a lot more depth and as you say the more you do that that ticks the the initial box the more case studies there are the more the more yeah. grand they cover yeah yeah abs- absolutely nothing 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 really to, to add to that and i i think you know there's room it's like you know there's a broad it's a broad church here there's room for all those different kinds of research qualitative research ethnographic research case study research researching in education is complex and all methodologies have their limitations including mm. gold standard quote unquote methodologies like double blind random controlled trials they have their place and they too have their limitations as you as you've just been pointing out yeah absolutely well it sounds like you found the right approach for you but of course what's even more important is the the outcomes and what they lead to and I guess that kind of leads us into talking about the learning power approach in action, you know, moving away from mm-hmm. the theory to the practice. So I wanted to just kind of, if you can, out, outline for us, you know, the the strategies and the techniques that, uh, that have been gleaned from the learning power approach in terms of, you know, bringing it into the classroom, what, what, what can be done on a, on a practical level by a teacher with a room full of students to sort of implement the sure. findings of the learning power approach and, and elevate the, the, I guess, learning power of their students. Yeah, sure. And um, that's, you know, that's the, the proof of the pudding is in the, is in the eating, isn't it? Or mm. as business people used to say, that's where the rubber hits the road. If it doesn't make a difference to what's going on in the classroom and to students' attitudes, to their levels of engagement, to their willingness to relish challenge rather than to feel threatened by it, and so on, then it's, you know, it's not worth a hill of beans, really. It's just an academic exercise. So that's where, you know, a lot of my work, most of my work now, before lockdown, was actually working with classroom teachers, whole school staff, uh, ministries of education. I've worked a lot with... Um, a little bit with the Ministry of Education in Victoria, quite a lot in South Australia, uh, with the Department of Education and Child Development, as I think it's now called, Um, and uh, with schools in New South Wales, I've been working uh, quite a lot recently, just again to kind of explore the possibilities and help teachers discover lots of little things. So first of all, you have to try and take this complex notion of culture and pull it apart and say, what does it consist of? Well, it consists of the la- the language that teachers use, what they habitually notice or don't notice. It consists of the layout of the furniture in the room, which affords either, for example, affords group work or it doesn't. Either it suggests that the only conversations worth having are the ones that go via the teacher, or you lay the chairs out differently, and uh, there's a, that contributes to a different kind of mood. Or what you, what you put on the walls of your classroom, carry messages about what's of value. What do you choose of students' work to display? What's your image of what we're proud of around here? So th- there are lots of little practical things like that. Things like, what, you know, all of this is cast as experiments. There's no magic bullet here. There's no one size fits all. So really what we've assembled is just like a big smorgasbord, a big buffet of things that other teachers have tried and found beneficial. So it's not these things don't come with a kind of, you know, life to lifeline guarantee but just, you know, other, pe- other teachers have tried this, it worked for them, or they found it useful. So, you know, here's something that you might like to think about. That's, that's all we offer to people, and which I think is probably the best way of offering, not like, thou shalt do it like this, which because mm. one size doesn't fit all, one size fits nobody in the education world. There is very, there are very little more, 
very few workplaces as complex as a room full of 31 individuals put there with a learning focus and a learning task for an hour or 45 minutes. You know, it's a very complex workplace and you have to be present and flexible and fluid and have a range of things at your disposal as a teacher so that your developing intuition about that space can lead you to pull up different bits of your toolkit, different bits of your uh, your apparatus, if you like, uh, at different times. So what yeah. can you do? I mean, just little things like, you know, have you thought about moving your teacher's desk from the front of the room to the back of the room? Try it. See what difference yeah. it makes. Does it move, does it create a different dynamic in terms of that, you know, all eyes on the teacher? Does it signal that you're expecting students to be more independent, that you're, as it were, a bit more like the sheepdog than the shepherd. Your job is to kind of, you know, keep people in or keep people together, but you're not actually the fount of all knowledge. You're not actually leading them. Little things like that. It doesn't work for everybody. Depends on the age. It'll depend on the subject. It'll depend on the ethos in the school. But that's one little thing. You could stick up a little tool on the wall of your classroom, which we call the riskometer, which is where students in primary school can they can put their photo, which has got a little bit of Velcro on the back, to indicate the level of challenge that they've set for themselves as they're embarking on doing a bit of individual study or working with their learning buddy to solve some sums. Are they going to do something really tricky today? Are they going to put their picture way up the top of the riskometer? Never multiplied, never tried to multiply two four digit numbers together before. But hey, feeling good. My mum was in a good Today's mood this morning. Today's yeah. the day. Let's see if we can crack it. Not feeling quite so good. Put my picture a bit lower down. No shame in that. I'm going to choose something that are easier, which are going to consolidate my learning rather than be more adventurous. You can do that. What about choosing things to go up on the walls of the classroom? Do you just display the 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 best product? You know, we've all year fours have all been painting sunflowers. And there's Rashida's best sunflower and there's Tim's best sunflower and there's Moana's best sunflower. And you can't see anything of the labor that went in, of the trial and error, of the journey, of the learning behind that progress it, that in that classroom it's like the only thing you're interested in is the stuff that the parents will find brilliant right mm. but you could change the display so that Rashida now puts up not just her best sunflower but two or three of her earlier sunflowers so that she can take you and show you quite proudly the progress that she's made what she learned along the way that gives a different message it opens up a focus on the process on improvement, on in journeying, on experimentation, doesn't it, right? So yeah. it's a very practical, it's a very concrete thing. And we have hundreds of little things like that, which you can just sort of sprinkle around in your classroom. And then you have to sort of work them into the everyday life of the classroom. It's no use just putting up a poster about growth mindset or something like that and hoping that it'll do the job. You have to work this into it. It's a bit like making mayonnaise, you know. You have to pour the oil in very slowly and whisk it a lot, otherwise it goes wrong. So you put one little drop of oil, one little innovation into your classroom and work it in so it becomes second nature to you and your students. And then another little drop and then another little drop. And over the course of two or three or four or six or 12 months, you'll find that that, I'm mixing my metaphors terribly, but never mind, you'll find yes, that, that the mood right. music or the undertow in the classroom has shifted. The students are now up for a challenge, better at talking with each other, saying, no, 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 don't tell us, sir. give us another five minutes because we want the satisfaction. We want to experience the pride of having figured it out for ourselves. They've, mm. they've tasted the, the juice of that. that they're, so isn't there? There's, like, there's, there's a pride that you get that, that you don't get any other way other than having tunneled your way through difficulty and uncertainty and come out with something better than you thought you were capable of doing. 
Yeah, of course, uh, the sense of achievement involved. Exactly, in that. rather than sitting yeah. there passively waiting for the teacher to tell you the right answer. So that's just a, li yeah. a little sprinkling of things, Simon. But, you know, it's like the, our suite of books, the Learning Power Approach books. We have one general one overview and then one specifically really practical workbook to, targeted for primary school, elementary school teachers, one for high school or secondary school teachers, and the new one for school leaders about how you bind all that classroom work together so that you get the synergy in the school. So the parents can taste it, the local employers can taste it, it. They're, the students are getting the same message as they move from their chemistry lesson to their English lesson to their history lesson and so on. You get much better, much faster change if there's a common sense of vision and practice. Um, and that's the last, that's as I say, the most recent book. And I'm exhausted after writing this, working with these four series of books so I'm taking a little break I'm doing something else at the moment but uh, we're well earned but we're very very proud of really having drawn all this this these global influences together and said if you're interested in this if you're interested in more than the ATAR scores and the NAPLAN and all those conventional indicators if you deep down in your guts if you think that education should be offering more than that should be more than about university entrance and ATAR scores. Here's how to do it. And here's testimony from hundreds of other teachers around the planet who are all on this journey of creating 21st century education, which helps young people learn to be good at learning for life and getting the grades they need to get to the University of Melbourne to read medicine or whatever it might be. Because we can't yeah. present these as opposites, things that you have to pull apart. The holy grail is kids who are better at school learning, who hoover up the stuff that they have to learn in their chemistry or their business studies or their PE or whatever, more, more effectively and more enjoyably and more economically, but the gold dust that is left behind from their experience of school is something that will carry them through the ups and downs of the rest of their lives so that they remain, when they're 73 years old or 80 years old, inquisitive and open-minded and interesting people to be with because they are interested in things. Mm. And that's, that's what I'd like the legacy of this approach to be. Yeah, well, it's... You know, it's it's really, it's really wonderful outline there of all of the the various facets and aspect of the the strategies and approaches. And you know, what's really, what sounds to me like a real major asset to the learning power approach and how you've outlined it there is that this this idea of this, I suppose this this almost tapas menu of various things that can be done, mm -hmm. where it's all of these different little approaches that can be sprinkled in it, it, it it's really beneficial in a number of ways in the sense that there's a great degree of adaptability and flexibility where it's when you have all of these different things to choose from yes it's much easier to find something that will suit the class and also that in in, in a progression sense it's this idea that in, in instead of one great massive change to everything which when you bring it in the, everything changes all at once this idea that you can sprinkle in yeah. as you go and it's incremental change yes. along yeah. the road. So yeah, it's yeah. like in, in terms uh, both of both of those, those senses. Yeah, Bo both of those, you've, put, you've summarized that very nicely. Both of those things mm -hmm. are really integral to our sense of, of what we're doing, what's important. That, that you have to, teachers and school principals have to be able to customize. There's no point in saying, here's the latest magic bullet everybody's got to do it. We've all got to do synthetic phonics or we've all got to do blended learning or we've all got to do this, that or the other. It's right. Schools aren't like that. And you can't just do it overnight. You know, you can't just say, you know, all your, all your teachers have been leopards up until Friday and from next Monday you've all got to be tigers. You've got to change your spots mm -hmm. into stripes overnight that's human nature doesn't work that way come on like wise up people this takes time it takes commitment it takes the willingness to experiment to support each other 
to and it takes a bit of fire in your belly to say this may be difficult and there are all these other pressures for the NAPLAN scores and the ATAR scores and all of that but we can and will offer something deeper and better than that okay guys how are we going to do it and that's the yeah. that's the if people are interested in that kind of approach rather than just getting another brand to put on the school note paper or you know the latest fad to to mm. you know to say yeah we're doing growth mindset or we're doing this that and the other it's like when people are grown up enough to want to go to do something that is deeper more sustainable more demanding because you have to think about it in order to customize it when people get to that stage they can come to us and we've got the resources to help them along yeah absolutely and and along that theme of variability I, I just wanted to ask you know i think you touched on a little bit earlier but just to dig in a little deeper i imagine that you know uh, 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 you know we, we we've talked in in sort of broader terms about classrooms in general but obviously one of the there's a number of variables within there obviously the most obvious one being different age groups mm -hmm. you know sure. and, and this idea that you know a classroom of of, of five-year-olds what's going to work for them is probably not going to be or there's not going to be a huge ton of overlap between what works for them in terms of learning power approach and what works for a classroom of 17, 18 year olds. No, you would so actually, you would, to... you'd, you'd be surprised how, uh, oh. y yes, of course, there are different nuances, things that would feel babyish to the 18 year olds or things that would be beyond the grasp. But w what's amazed us is the common core of this approach is you can okay. just cut, customize or tweak some of these little things and you can shift them from a class of five-year-olds to a class of 16-year-olds with relatively little difficulty. Not all of them, but a surprising number of them. And actually, when I go and talk to business audiences, you can get them to use the riskometer. I have, there are lots of schools that have a riskometer in the staff room for the teachers to use to think about am I going to take a big experiment or a small experiment in my biology class today it's like you know so providing we re retain our resourcefulness and our imagination a lot of these things really do swap over not all of them but quite a lot well yeah that's 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 really interesting you know I, I, I suppose yeah at, at first glance at first thought you would assume as I did that you know, there'd be very little translation, but I suppose it's about, it's about even w within the flexibility to try different things, there, a further degree of flexibility to change the things that you're trying, tweak them, depending on your audience, depending on the size of the classroom, the age of the classroom, depending on, as you say, you talked about business audience there, whether or not it is a classroom or not, just, I guess, having that flexibility to adjust mm. here and there, but the same technique with the right adjustments can work. Yeah. For, for almost yeah, anyone. Similar things. And then once people get more familiar with this approach, it's like, you know, we offer them like starter kits. You know, have you thought of this or try this or other people have used this? But as you become more familiar with the, uh, the overall approach, with the spirit of the approach, then you start to be more generative and more creative. You, you invent your own things. Almost all of the things that go into our books are things that I first heard about from imaginative, resourceful, innovative teachers who've sent me emails saying, hey, you might be interested to know I tried this and it worked really well with the, this, this group. So I just act like a, I think of myself as being a bit more like a honeybee. You know, I go around and collect different bi various, bi bits yeah. of pollen from different classrooms and then I go to another flower and I, you know, shake off a bit of pollen there and say, you know, good luck. Yeah, well, it's a good, it's, <laughs> it's a good way to be. Um, well, so I guess, you know, we, we've, what I, I can, I can really hear all of the, the value and the great positive effects that come about in these classrooms through what you're saying. But of course, you know, it, and it, well, in a perfect world, it would be nothing but positive progression all the time with, with, with these techniques and with the learning power approach. But I imagine that it's only inevitable that certain challenges, certain issues are going to arise in, in classrooms where adopting this learning power approach and the various techniques involved, you know, can sometimes run into issues along sure, the way, both with regards, I would say, to, to students mm -hmm. and also to teachers. And I just wanted to see, you know, are there any common 
common challenges that you see come up for for teachers and for students uh, or even from teachers and from students sure. with regards to the learning power approach and what are they and you know what how would you say is the best way to to approach solving them sure well again you know there are lots of there are, you know lots of things that that they don't work you know not all of these things work well first time so mm. you you know you may have to be a bit more determined or a bit more say you know well that didn't work terribly well how could i shift that but you're right there are lots of you know what we what we call in books two and three in the series the books for the practicing teachers the primary and the secondary teachers all of them most of the chapters have a section at the end called bumps in the road which are about how you, you know, if it doesn't go perfectly first time, what do you do? Or what are some of the kind of mindsets or the beliefs? So, you know, I would, one, of just like, you know one of the common, just to illustrate things, some of the kids don't like it to start with. Mm -hmm. Particularly some of the high achieving kids don't like it because it's a bit new and a bit different. And it's asking them to take more responsibility and to take more risk. It's asking them to flounder with their learning rather than sitting in the front row with a smug smile on their face and their hand going up all the time, liking being the brightest, which they think means the person who knows the answer quickest already. They think me being a good learner means always getting everything right first time without breaking sweat. And that's a very, very narrow conception of what a real life learner is. A real life learner is so someone who has to have several goes, who's writing a piece for their newspaper, who drafts it, who shows it to a friend, who gives it to the sub editor, who reworks it, and who eventually comes out with something that they're pleased with. And they really made it sparkle because it's been through several drafts because, and they've sweated over it a bit and they've been humble enough to accept some feedback for it that's what real learning is like it's not just you know sitting there showing off that you can get 20 out of 20 without breaking sweat like what's the value in that you know but lots of mums and dads think that's what having a bright child means so you can get some pushback not only from the teachers and from the kids themselves but sometimes from the parents so particularly when you're trying to change the whole culture of a school, these issues need to be addressed. There are legitimate worries, obviously, like what is this asking of me? A teacher will say, how are you asking me to be different? So you need to be able to be ready ready for that. But also just you know, what we discovered, talking to lots of experienced culture change school principals, is you, you have to walk the talk and talk the talk all the time, particularly with parents, so that you're just working. It's like a multi-layered culture change project. You have to be working on the teachers. Teachers have to be working on the kids. The kids then act as ambassadors going back to talk to their mums and dads. So mums and dads get rather startled by their five-year-old who comes home and says, Dad, what have you found tricky at work today? What really mm. challenged you? What made you use your learning muscles? And dad goes, hey, what? <laughs> <laughs> and they're starting to have a different kind of conversation at home. So, yeah. they, you know, there's a whole range of things. Some of them we can anticipate. But basically, if you just, you know, if you can help teachers feel that this is something positive and practical, what came out of our research, our evaluation research, I summed up in three words that this kind of approach is highly desirable. Desirable is the first word. Second word is challenging. It's challenging for kids. It's challenging for teachers because it's about habit change. We're, and as I said, we're all creatures of habit and that requires a bit of effort and a bit of awareness and a bit of trial and error to change our habits. So desirable, challenging. But the third word is the most important because I've seen it so many times the third word is possible it does work so if you just persist a little bit it's like anything else that takes practice and a bit of coaching and a bit of feedback you don't get good at anything uh, unless you go through that process so if a school and a teachers are willing to do that like one of the schools that i've worked with for example is st luke's grammar school in sydney and they've, okay. they're in something like their fifth or sixth year 
of going through this process with a very committed, determined, skillful head teacher who's sadly retiring, unfortunately, but she's left leaving the school in very good shape. Um, but she's managed, you know, she did the work to get the staff on board, to get the parents on board, to get the children to understand why this is important, how it's going to be useful for them in the rest of their lives, in their working lives and in their leisure lives. And now that school hums with learning, with participation, with challenge, with experimentation, with conversation. And they've rocketed up the league tables in terms of their conventional scores. So it's possible. You can have it, have it all ways. You can have it both ways. You can build character for life and you can get those precious examination scores. Proof of concept. It works. Desirable, difficult, challenging, but possible. Well, there you go. It's it's. It's a good slogan to have because you know it it doesn't doesn't sugarcoat what's going to be involved. That's right. Take work, but yeah, it is it is very important, and I suppose you know it, almost adopting a learning power approach to a, the learning power approach exactly. is is kind of the best guarantee of of success. the The last thing that I wanted to ask you with relation to the learning power approach is just very quickly uh, quickly get your thoughts uh, a little bit about the uh, the role that resources can play within um within the learning power approach but both you know maybe more physical offline resources obviously goes without saying that your books the series that you refer to is very key resource with regards to that but also whether or not you know in your experience online resources can which have obviously played a very big role you know in terms of the current context of learning they've really taken on increased importance with the lockdown but you know, to I guess to what extent can can both online and offline resources uh, play a role in the learning power approach? How they how they can help if if they if you feel they can into kind of embedding it in in, in schools and sort of advancing what it can the the, the positive impact it can have yeah. in classrooms. Yeah, uh, I mean, digital technologies are amazing resources. Uh, as we all know, kids out of school and their mums and dads and even their grandmothers and grandfathers, it's like our smartphone is, to all intents and purposes, part of our brain now. And schools are grappling, schools are really struggling with how to create sufficient maturity in the student body. So that, so that they can allow students to capitalize on the kinds, the degree of the amazing degree of independent learning, researching that, these, that your phone makes available to you without opening up all the downsides of, you know, texting and sexting and doing all the other things that kids will do with those technologies. So you can't hold the flood, the flood back. You know, it's ridiculous that schools, some schools are still trying to hold back the tide and you almost have like to check your phone at the door in the morning. That would be like saying, mm. you know, we know you can't come in with a pencil. You know, like pencil was the latest technology once. You know, you'll lose mm. your skills of sharpening your quill if you're allowed to use a, a fountain pen. And the whole, you know, and you'll go soft and what have you. So we have to find ways. We have to grapple with that problem because the degrees of independence. I mean, there's a wonderful man called Sugata Mitra who's doing great research on just how groups of small groups of kids with a smartphone or a tablet, the amazing things that they can do for themselves without the benefit of a teacher and how they can astonish us, even five and six year olds with the quality of what they can find out, what they can research for themselves, if they have learning power and if they're given permission to use it. Otherwise, for the, you know, the phones and the technologies become a problem. So mm. it's all a matter of how these tools are framed. And as I say, you know, having that 
complicated conversation with children and their parents so that you can negotiate mature use. They can understand what the boundaries of use are so that you don't have to go for either nothing or everything. Do you create a middle way down there? And then, you know, then the sky's the limit. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. And it, it, it's, it very much, you know, what you're talking about there with regards to digital technology, it sort of ties in very much uh, to the ethos of the learning power approach in general, which is this, you know, the, this ability to be flexible and creative with it, but uh, I guess it, it, desirable, difficult, and uh, ultimately possible, which is what I'm hearing, you know, with regards to that, and all across the board, uh, with regards to the learning power approach. And I almost feel it's a shame to to bring our, our conversation about it to an end because I feel like you could talk about it <laughs> until the till the cows come home. Yeah, but well, I can't. Unfortunately, that, I can. I'm afraid. <laughs> but yes, unfortunately, that's all we have time for this time. Oh. However, before you go, yeah. one last quick question for you. Yeah. We always like whenever we have guests on to close out close out the chat with just a quick. We we call it the hot tip. It can be a little piece of advice. For teachers, glean from your years in education. It can even be a, a, a fun little anecdote, something you've picked up along the way. It can be more serious if you like. Doesn't have to be all that, all that lighthearted. Totally up to you. But just want to get your your hot tip for the day. Okay, so uh, here's the hot tip and and a little anecdote as well to 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 oh, to, to, for the price to, to go one. with it. So one of the things that that you need in learning power classroom. One of the little tools that lots of people use, it's very familiar, it's not specific to us, lots of people use this tool, is the traffic lights tool. You want to know whether your kids are in the learning zone, right? And if you use traffic lights, it's like kids have a little cube or a little something or cups that they can show you. And they have a red one and they have an orange one and they have a green one like, like traffic lights. And you just say, show me your cups. If you see a sea of red, that means... It, it's too difficult. We don't know what we're doing. We need some help. We need some more structure, some scaffolding. If you see a sea of green, that means it's too easy. Like, why are we doing this? It's not. So where you want people to be is, where the, is with the middle cup. And I was talking yeah. two or three years ago. I was running a masterclass at the EduTech conference in Sydney with a room of about, I don't know, 80 or 90 people. And I was talking about this technique. And I said, you know, what's, we were we'd having a lighthearted conversation about what the colour of the middle cup was. And I said, in England, the traffic lights, like the light, the, the, light, the colour in the middle, we call it amber, right? Red, amber, green, right? And, then, and someone else said, oh, no, we, don't, we, we wouldn't call it amber, we'd call it orange. And so we were having kind of an mm -hmm. argument about this. And then a guy stuck his, uh, the, from the back stuck his hand up. He had a flaming red beard and a flaming red head of hair. And he stood up and said in a big, loud voice, it's not the amber zone, it's not the orange zone, it's the ginger zone. So <laughs> finding, looking for the ginger zone in the classroom is one of our top tips. Well, I, I, I very much enjoyed that. And, and it, it, it may just have been a good enough anecdote to change my approach. I may be referring... Whenever I encounter a light of that color, I'm going to refer to the ginger light from here on out. Okay. Uh, an excellent new approach. Well, listen, that is all that we have time for. Guy, thank you so much for coming on, for talking to us and sharing sharing your wisdom and your journey with uh, the learning power approach and everything along the way. It's been an absolute, an absolute pleasure. Yeah, it's been a delight for me, Simon. Thank you for the opportunity. All the best. No worries. And to all the... Listeners, uh, if you want to catch any other episodes, you can find them on whatever platform you're listening to this on. You can also, if you want to check us out on our main site, find us at getademy.com. For now, it is goodbye from Guy. Goodbye. And goodbye from me. See ya. <laughs>